platform of the Daylight Academy, people who otherwise hardly meet or don't talk to each other so much because they're in very different scientific communities. We believe that the, the modes of light and the principles and actions of light, we can learn from different disciplines. And uh, for that reason, we also uh, initiated this virtual seminar today. If you would like to connect with anyone involved here in the discussion later on, please use the address of the Daylight Academy office and just contact the, the people there and they will be happy to bring you in contact if you would like to whatever have more intense discussions or uh, more discussions on these things. Uh, speaker, Dirk Tauner. Um, Dirk, Dirk is a chemist and I think he's best described as a chemist with many interests. And um, he's probably one of the first person who really reused and popularized the term photopharmacology. And so he will give us, an, um, give us an overview and introduce us to the use of light to control at the molecular level um, molecules. And then we will see what effects this may have. So he is the person kind of representing today the field of chemistry, medicine and applications in molecular biology of light on there. With this, I would like to give the word to you, Dirk, and we are happy that you're here. Thanks, Birkert, for this lovely introduction. Let me share my screen. Um, and thanks for putting this together. This is actually quite exciting. This is the first time that I'm participating in something like this. Can you see my presentation? Let me start it on photopharmacology. Excellent, perfect. So as Birkert mentioned, photopharmacology is uh, an attempt to control biological function with light responsive molecules with as you will see uh, a little switchable molecular fascination uh, uh, with light and molecules photochemistry is an absolutely amazing uh, topic and as chemists we, we really love working on this um, um, just to illustrate how amazing light is uh, daylight that is uh, this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy right the Andromeda galaxy is the furthest object that you can see with your unaided eye. It's about two and a half million light years away, uh, which means that a, a photon that emanates uh, from the center of the Andromeda galaxy uh, uh, travels for two and a half million years. And then through the atmosphere and through your tear film and through your cornea and through your lens and through your vitreous until it hits the retina, this light responsive tissue, oops, um, where the molecular, uh, the chemistry is happening. Um, and that happens at a ridiculously low intensity. This happens at 10 to the 5 photons per square centimeter per second. Uh, just to illustrate this, if you uh, go skiing the next day after you've seen the Andromeda galaxy at night, you have 10 to the 17 photons per square centimeter per second on a gletscher, on an ice field, uh, which means that the human vision uh, spans a dynamic range of uh, 12 orders of magnitude. And there's really nothing else in physiology or in biology for that matter that does this. And that's one of the reasons why we are, why we are so fascinated with it. Um, but of course, uh, we are also fascinated by the biology and by the chemistry uh, that happens uh, in your retina. This is a very simplified diagram of your retina. Let me actually move away uh, these uh, pictures of yours. Here we go. Uh, so I can read my own slides. It's a diagram of the retina uh, that shows uh, that the retina essentially consists of three layers. They are the rods and cones, the so-called photoreceptor cells which express, as we will see in a moment, a, a type of protein called rhodopsin or opsins that does the actual photochemistry. And then these rods and cones talk to a layer of interstitial cells, bipolar cells, uh, amacrine cells, whatever they are called. And finally, this information is conveyed to the retinal ganglion cells, uh, GC, which uh, project the nervous opticus into your brain where the information then is, uh, is, uh, is uh, finally processed. But I have to say that a lot of the processing is happening already at the level of the retina. The retina really is a part of the brain that is put forth and where much of the processing uh, already happens. Huh? Uh, so what happens actually on a molecular level? Uh, what happens on a molecular level is shown in the next slide. Here it is. Um, what happens is that uh, a, a small organic molecule, a sort of fatty lipophilic molecule called retinal, which is bound to the protein undergoes and isomerization. There is a form which is spent, uh, this is the so-called 11 cis form, and upon absorption of a photon, uh, this double bond here in the middle uh, summarizes, goes from cis 
to trans uh, by uh, rotating literally. And this rotation is actually felt by a protein envelope that encumbers, uh, that sort of embraces this molecule. This protein envelope is shown here in a little movie, so you have to imagine that uh, retina of the organic molecule sticks in between here. This is my surface rendering. And this protein is not just uh, a protein that circulates around in the cell, it's actually bound to the membrane. It's the transmembrane protein. And uh, this transmembrane protein, as shown here in all its glory, is embedded in the lipid membrane of your, uh, of your photoreceptor cells. And when this uh, action, this movement happens, ultimately through a very complicated process, this uh, 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 results in a change of the transmembrane potential and in, uh, in, the, in a change of uh, the release of a neurotransmitter called glutamate. And then many, many other things happen. It's a really, really complex uh, uh, series of events, but ultimately, uh, the uh, uh, retinal ganglion cells fire, fire action potentials, and that is what you, what you, what you perceive as light. Uh, at these extremely uh, low intensities as well. Um, so um, it turns out that uh, in certain types of blindness, um, the photoreceptor cells are gone, are degraded. Uh, this happens, for instance, in macular degeneration. Uh, this happens in late stage, in retinitis pigmentosa and in late stage uh, uh, macular degeneration. Uh, you lose the rods and cones. The cones, by the way, are uh, uh, responsible for daylight vision, so this is more relevant to this uh, meeting. The rods are uh, responsible for night vision. We have evolved two types of uh, visual perception to uh, again span this enormous uh, dynamic range. And both of them are gone. They are, for various reasons, uh, are degrading which means that the uh, retinal ganglion cells uh, at the bottom here don't receive any input anymore. And therefore you turn blind. However, if you could hijack some of these other proteins shown here on the right side, there's a whole laundry list of other proteins that are expressed in the bipolar cells and expressed in the retinal ganglion cells and also these other inhibitory cells, amacrine cells, horizontal cells, if you could turn these proteins into photoreceptors by endowing them with an artificial photo switch, you'll see in a moment which one it is, with a chemical that is flight responsive, perhaps this sort of information transfer could be sort of hijacked, uh, could be bypassed, if you will, the need to input from the photoreceptor cells, and perhaps you would have some neuronal output here, some firing along the nervous opticals that would be perceived as vision. And this was one of the goals of our research program, which we started some uh, 17, 18 years ago now in, in, in Berkeley, teamed up with a fantastic team of neuroscientists to make this happen. So we are aiming at artificial vision, which uh, 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 uses artificial synthetic molecules that are also light responsive, uh, like retinal, undergo the same form of change, of bending, of uh, isomerization, as we call it, uh, to, uh, to restore visual responses. And, uh, uh, just saying that this has mushroomed in a very broad uh, uh, sort of effort um, going through all these different proteins which we have endowed with a photo switch, but we've become quite adept at doing this and we call this, as Burkett mentioned, photopharmacology. Um, all right, here is the little photo switch that could. This is a molecule that is uh, very uh, uh, sort of familiar to organic chemists. Uh, everybody who, go, who went through a sort of introductory organic chemistry lab probably had to work with this at some point. It's an azobenzene molecule. It's artificial. It does not really occur in nature. This is something that uh, uh, humans have uh, invented in the 1820s and then in the 1830s, uh, in the 1930s rather, it was established that this molecule undergoes an isomerization upon irradiation. So when you take the parent molecule, azobenzene itself, you have to use UVA light to bend it to the cis form from the long elongated trans form to the bent uh, cis form. And then with 500 nanometers with green light, you can bend it back, you can just let it sit and uh, it will isomerize back. Um, but that's just a, a sort of parent molecule. We have over the years created many other molecules that have slightly different photophysical and uh, photochemical properties. For instance, this molecule, DNAC here, this molecule is an azobenzene they can be bent with blue light, 472 nanometers is blue light. Uh, and then once it is bent, uh, it actually falls back very quickly within milliseconds. As soon as the light is gone, uh, thermally it isomerizes back. It turns out that this molecule is a blocker of an ion channel, of the famous potassium channel that is all important for neuronal activity in the transform. 
It is actually a photo switchable version of lidocaine. That's something you're all familiar with, I assume, because when you go to a dentist, you get an injection of lidocaine to numb your nerves. And uh, this molecule in the stretch long form indeed numbs the nerve because it blocks potassium and also sodium channels. Whereas if you bend it to the cis form, it does not block and therefore allows neuronal activity uh, to, uh, to happen. And this very, very simple principle uh, was used uh, uh, to make a blind retina photosensitive again. Let's take a look at this. So we are uh, applying this molecule. This molecule, by the way, mostly targets um, retinal ganglion cells. So these are the cells that spike, that fire these famous action potentials. Uh, and they do now in a light-dependent way. In order to investigate this, we use some beautiful electrophysiology, which we, we, we can irradiate with blue LEDs. So thanks to all of those here who have been involved in developing and optimizing LEDs. They're just awesome. We absolutely love them. Uh, there is a Nobel Prize for a reason for this. And here is the situation of a blind retina before we add the molecule. What you see here on top are individual traces that sort of measure the electrical activity around uh, these retinal ganglion cells. So we, uh, these are so-called extracellular field potentials, doesn't matter what it is. It sort of gives you an idea of how uh, spiky, how active they are, these individual traces. Then you sum these traces on the bottom and you get this noise, right? Uh, it turns out, but it doesn't matter whether you shine white light on it or darkness, uh, no light, uh, white light, no light, white light, no light, there's absolutely no response. And that is expected because this is a blind retina. It's a blind mouse retina, by the way. Um, uh, and when we add now a molecule, very simply, we sort of add the molecule to this tissue, we see this dramatic change in neuronal activity upon irradiation. So when you irradiate, uh, you see a large increase in spiking frequency. This sort of is an idea of firing rate, how quick these nerve cells fire, uh, whereas in the dark, uh, it's much less. It's, so it's, it's much more, much less, much more, much less. This is some of older slide from 2014, but it was the first demonstration that this works. In the meantime, we've applied this to a more uh, elaborate models of blindness. Uh, stay tuned, it's not in humans yet. Um, we have gone through the safety studies um, and we uh, have uh, demonstrated the efficacy in higher animals, but in order to, um, uh, to demonstrate this in humans, we have to go through a few more steps of drug development. In any case, if this works, it would be a rather uh, simple way to restore vision that, uh, in my opinion, could be competitive with uh, optogenetic methods. Uh, you're probably aware, you might be aware that there are some gene therapy approaches to do this, and there are also some devices which you implant uh, into into uh, uh, the eye to electrically stimulate uh, 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 the retina. We do this with uh, molecules uh, that we can uh, chemically stimulate. Let me move on uh, to a second topic where photopharmacology, I think, can move fast in terms of clinical translation, and that is cancer. Right? Um, it turns out that cancer, as you all know, is an uncontrolled growth of cells, uh, which, uh, of course, require the cytoskeleton to grow and uh, to be white. So this network of uh, fibers, of actin, uh, tubulin, intermediary filaments, you name it, that, sh uh, that uh, control the shape of a cell, but also are crucially important for cell division, for pulling the chromosomes apart, for instance. This is done through microtubules. And here's a beautiful rendering of, uh, of a cell where the actin cytoskeleton is, uh, is uh, um, uh, rendered in red, whereas the two microtubule cytoskeleton is rendered in, in, in green. And it turns out that these microtubules have fascinating dynamic instability. These are the cables that pull in a cell and that push um, to a certain extent. And these are uh, tubes uh, that are made up of proteins that come together and fall apart. This is a highly dynamic process. This is the so-called dynamic instability of uh, tubulin. Uh, and we can control this dynamic instability with a photoswitchable version of a very famous poison. So it turns out that colchicine uh, that comes from uh, the autumn crocus, from Colchicum autumnale, uh, it disrupts this microtubule dynamics. So here's the structure of colchicine. It turns out the colchicine has a little cousin known as Compreta statin A4, which has a cis double bond. It has this double bond where two things are on the same side, called a cis double bond, instead of this seven-membered ring. But other than that, it has this rim that looks somewhat similar, and it indeed it's, it, it, it mimics colchicine, but only in the cis form. And we could not uh, resist from putting an NN double bond in the middle to make it an azobenzene. 
And now the azobenzene is presumably active in the cis form, which you can achieve by irradiating with violet light with 400 nanometers, whereas if it falls back to the trans form, it becomes inactive. And this was uh, developed together with a postdoc of mine with Oliver Thorne Seshold um, and was demonstrated to actually work beautifully. So what you see here is a cell where the microtubule dynamics has been visualized. Uh, let's start the movie. This sort of uh, hectic buzzing activity uh, is uh, the microtubule network as it forms and as it disassembles and forms and disassembles. And when you don't add this molecule, which I just showed you, this azobenzene, uh, then nothing happens. Uh, this also sits there. The microtubules form and disassemble as they should. This is called the dynamic instability. However, if you add the molecule, nothing in green, and then stop. And it goes again. And stop. And it goes again. And this translates to the optical control, to the light control of cell proliferation. What you see uh, here are two cells in an embryo, in a C. elegans, in a warm embryo. These cells are synchronized, as one says, they would go uh, cell division at the same rate. The chromosomes are lined up in both cases, but the one on the left side, we irradiate and we prevent the chromosomes from being pulled apart because these cables are not uh, functional. Whereas on the right side, uh, uh, they do get pulled apart and that, of course, ultimately translates to the optical control of cell division, which is exactly what you want to do in cancer. You want to prevent cell division, uncontrolled cell division, but you want to do this with the precision, with the ultimate precision that light affords. Light is unbeaten, unbeatable, I would even say, in its ability uh, to temporarily and spatially control action, right? uh, and that remotely as well. So our dream, our grand vision is, let's go back, our grand vision is that we, uh, we make molecules that are inactive in the dark, they're not toxic, like other microtubal disruptors. The most famous one is Taxol, right? Uh, if you ever talked with somebody who underwent chemotherapy and had to take Taxol, I can tell you this is horrible, this is an ordeal, because Taxol acts everywhere, right? And there is little uh, uh, sort of selectivity other than that uh, cancer cells uh, divide much faster than other cells. But the hair follicle cells, for instance, that divide fast are affected and this is where you lose your hair when you're on cancer chemotherapy with Taxol. And these are exactly the side effects we try to avoid by making molecules, uh, pharma, car, uh, drugs that you can turn on and off with light, like the one you've seen before. So the motto is apply globally and activate locally. I think I have five more minutes. Am I correct? Hello? Yes, you're good in time. So five more minutes is good. Okay. Five more minutes and I will uh, uh, top this off with something that is brand new that we have just uh, uh, put on the web and uh, will soon publish. This uh, concerns a class of molecules that mark proteins for destruction. Uh, and we would like to control these molecules with light. These molecules are called protax, uh, proteolysis targeting chimeras, and they're currently all the rage in pharmacology. Uh, this is one of the hottest fronts in cancer therapy and pharmacology. These are molecules, pretty big molecules like the one shown here, that grab a protein and then make sure that this protein gets flagged for destruction. Uh, proteins uh, in a cell get destroyed in an orderly fashion. They don't just fall apart after time, but they actually get uh, destroyed uh, through the so-called proteasome system. Uh, ubiquitilation, uh, just throwing out a few passwords, there were Nobel prizes for this, of course, as well. So the life cycle of a protein is not only consisting of how it's made on the ribosome, but also how it is destroyed. And uh, this flagging a protein for destruction with a synthetic molecule is really exciting because this molecule can function as a catalyst. It can turn over and therefore you can have very low concentrations of a molecule that promotes this flagging. And these molecules are called products. Uh, and here's one, uh, which by the way, on the left side, has uh, the structure of thalidomide. This is nothing else than the infamous contagon, mm -hmm. uh, originally marketed as a sleeping pill, uh, sadly, uh, but has made a comeback as an anti-cancer compound because the mechanism was figured out what really happened there. And this is now a multi-billion dollar drug uh, known as lenalidomide or thalidomide, which has this makeup here. And on the other side, you have a ligand for whatever, which you want to destroy. Uh, and we could not resist uh, putting in a photo switch. So we put in our azobenzene, shown here in the cis form, uh, replacing this part, so to speak. And the dream was that this molecule is inactive in the dark, and the azobenzene is trans. But if you summarize it to the cis form, this is the UVA light or with violet, deep violet light, uh, then it becomes active. And indeed, this is true. 
Uh, these are so-called Western plots. Let's look at one lane here. Uh, this is just what happens to a protein. These little mice uh, track uh, uh, ovals here. This is uh, just the visualization of a protein. Huh? Uh, a protein called BRD4, doesn't matter what it is, but it's critically involved in, uh, in, in, in reading the genome. And you see that this protein is not degraded, is not destroyed in the dark in the presence of our compound in different concentrations, 30 micromolar uh, to 100 nanomolar, 30 nanomolar, nothing happens, right? But as soon as we turn the light on, this protein gets destroyed at the concentration of uh, 1 micromolar, 300 nanomolar, it's gone. And this has interesting consequences uh, uh, for those into it. It actually leads to a control of CMYK, which is a very important target for anti-cancer drugs. So we're quite excited about this. And we can do this pretty quickly. So it turns out, whoops, mm -hmm. what happened there? Eh? Uh, As the shared window is closed, let me go back. Uh, uh, sorry, I think I just lost uh, my presentation. Let's do this again. So uh, this uh, degradation is happening fairly quickly. Uh, let me share it again. Uh, so I'm not sharing at the moment. Okay, okay let's no, go down. Right. I'm almost. At, I'm almost at the end. Uh, this is happening quickly within a few. Oh, I'm. I'm sorry. I don't know what's happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, hitting a. So, in other words, we can control this process, uh, and uh, I just want to throw out that if you want to hear more about this whole, uh, first of all, I want to show you the hero behind this, my graduate student, uh, Martin Reinders, and, his post and the postdoc by Matsura, who developed this. These, by the way, are these uh, 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 sort of cell disco systems with which we analyze protein levels, uh, so it looks also very good, it has this beautiful LED look, uh, this rainbow look uh, on the lab. And I want to conclude by saying that uh, photo switches, if you wonder uh, whether this can be clinically used, are indeed clinically relevant. So lighted medicine is a huge topic. There's such a thing called photodynamic therapy. We are trying to elevate photodynamic therapy to a new level of sophistication. And if you wonder whether uh, irradiation uh, and uh, babies are a good idea, I want to remind you that in order to cure neonatal jaundice, uh, where you accumulate uh, bilirubin, a degradation product of blood cells in large quantities, and then the babies turn yellow. In order to uh, uh, cure this, you actually radiate this molecule with blue light. You undergo a photo, you elicit a photo isomerization. The molecule can be, uh, is become soluble and then uh, can be excreted. And this is done in neonatal wards by wrapping babies with blankets of LEDs. So if it's good for babies, it must be good for us. And therefore, I'm quite uh, optimistic that uh, photo switches will ultimately uh, find a more expanded role in medicine. If you want to hear more about it, by the way, I would like to invite you to a conference which I'm organizing in New York City, Photopharmacology 3, taking place May 28, 29, 2020. And uh, soon you will hear more about it. Uh, the website will be set live. Uh, for now, I would like to, um, to thank you again, Burkhard, for inviting me. And uh, if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dirk. That was a great overview and introduction to the field. Uh, um, and uh, I think it was, was very exciting. Um, our audience is a little shy. So far, they don't have uh, placed any questions. So just to remind everybody listening, you can use either the chat to put a question or the, um, the, um, the yeah, question and answer. Just put the question there, I can read it and put it on, on and uh, we'll ask it then to, to Dirk on there. Am I, am I still sharing the screen, by the way? Um, no, it's fine, it's good. Okay, I'm not sharing the screen anymore, okay. No, no it's good, it's all good, no? Um, let me start off, the, the because of course I'm, I know the field uh, a little bit. Um, what is the, what, what is in your opinion, the, the, the current need on there? We see the molecular switches are already fine. So chemistry is good. There is still room for improvement. I would say better switches are absolutely needed. Heterocyclic okay. azobenzines, okay. right? Uh, so I would say that yeah. better switches that allow for deeper penetration of light, switches on the red end of the spectrum uh, that are still thermally stable are uh, very important. So yeah. more chemistry, more better chemistry is always needed, right? That always possible. Right, yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. I think this is something we, we definitely need to work on. 
Um, you mentioned the fantastic possibilities in, in uh, pharmacology applications on there. Um, but I, I remember uh, talking also with Ben Feringa, uh, who is also has from projects in the area on there. Mm -hmm. and, and so his impression from the feedback from um, pharmaceutical industry was not so positive. So um, what, is, what is your opinion or your impression on this? And uh, I'm, I'm also not, are there, are there currently drugs in development in pharmaceutical industry that use these principles uh, to be controlled, to control activity by light? Uh, yes and no. I mean, we have a startup on this and if you can call this industry, it's not big pharma at this stage. So the larger pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, have not picked this up yet because, you know, this is very risky at this stage and it's very, how shall I say, exploratory. Um, and industry in general, pharmaceutical industry does not like photoactive molecules because they associate photoactivity with phototoxicity, uh, which usually means production of single oxygen. And that is exactly what these photo switches don't do, right? They do not produce single oxygen because they are not photosensitizers for oxygen, they are photopharmaceuticals. They are summarized instead of giving the excess energy to oxygen and making single oxygen. So I think it will require a little bit more of education. Right? Uh, it turns out that I actually have uh, some ties now with local industry here in uh, New York, especially in the product uh, context. Um, as I said, this is currently a big uh, uh, deal in industry and uh, they are very uh, primed towards uh, thinking about how to make this even more effective. There are some concerns that these uh, products are too toxic because they turn over, they function like catalysts. Uh, so in other words, if you could switch off the toxicity at will uh, and not just wait for clearance in the metabolism, uh, this, would be, this could be useful. Right. As every brand new concept, uh, it will take some time until uh, this transpires. But you know, we keep pushing. Uh, I think I have given uh, enough talks now in industry to lay out the principles. Um, there is some concern about how to deliver light, uh, but, uh, and I see there is a question, I think. Uh, in yeah, this yeah. Questions, questions are now upcoming on there. Let me, let me phrase the question so that everybody can, can see this. So there's a question about future applications for uh, neurodegeneration diseases like Alzheimer. Do you, do you see something in this direction developing or possible? This is, would be wonderful if you could dissolve plaques with uh, photo switches. I think there is a possibility uh, especially, and I just wanted to mention this, since light delivery methodologies are becoming very, very sophisticated now, to the extent that you can think about drilling a hole in the skull and lowering an LED. Um, uh, there are devices by John Rogers, for instance, that are about eight millimeters in diameter, one millimeter uh, uh, thick now that can, uh, um, and even smaller ones are possible. So there's, there are 50 micron LEDs that you can, that you can Im implant. This was actually one that is wirelessly powered that I was referring to. So I think uh, the... Uh, we, we won't shy away in the future of interfacing humans with electronics. Uh, and if these electronics emit light, all the better. Right? Uh, and uh, I don't think I have to uh, explain to my colleagues here that this is a very hot and very interesting field. Um, uh, as I said, uh, we want to elevate photodynamic therapy uh, to a new level. So the light is used in medicine. Uh, by the way, photomedicine is, is old as medicine. The Egyptians have used it, right? Um, Soralin was used by the Egyptians um, mm -hmm. uh, and the third Nobel Prize uh, uh, in medicine went to Niels Finsen for photo, photodynamic therapy, for phototherapy, right, of lupus vulgaris. Now obsolete because there are antibiotics, but uh, so the idea of using light for therapy is to a certain extent uh, implemented in medicine. We just have to become more sophisticated with chemistry. In photodynamic therapy right now, you only make single oxygen, you burn everything around. You cauterize around and you maybe elicit the immune system a little bit. We think we can get better than this, uh, in part because uh, the ability and the, uh, the methods to deliver light are becoming really sophisticated. And of course, we're also in lockstep here with optogenetics, because in optogenetics, you don't only have to deliver a gene. A lot of people think about this uh, in human therapy, but you also have to deliver light. And, uh, right, yeah, there was also maybe you can address this quickly uh, because uh, we're running out of time a little bit. Um, how do we get the molecules, the follow switchable and then then activatable molecules, at the right place in the body? That was one question. We um, can target them with nanobodies with antibodies. So we have published on photo switch antibody conjugates to make them very very selective, or you get have good pharmacology, right? Um, no. So, uh, the, again, the idea in principle could be that they are everywhere, that they don't have to be targeted to specific cells, but they only activate or radiate them. 
Right. Uh, and then they're harmless, uh, ideally, uh, everywhere else. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But we can also add, add uh, additional targeting motifs such as antibodies and nanobodies. Right, yeah. How far are we away from human application and cancer treatment? Uh, that the answer, it's very hard to say because we've just started with mice. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And okay, uh, no, everybody, we... everybody can cure cancer in mice. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is the sad truth. Uh, and uh, it could happen very quickly. We're all waiting for the first clinical data on the products themselves. Uh, so this happens this year. Mm -hmm. if, this, uh, if they are clinically relevant, if this becomes a drug, Craig Cruz will get a Nobel Prize, right, for this new principle. Uh, and uh, we I think, I think we will be able to move it a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, for, for the uh, cytoskeleton targeting molecules, you should ask uh, Oliver von Seschold, who has been at the forefront of uh, putting this into, into animals. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to tell. Uh, it does work in animals, but again, we're at the mouse level, and the mouse level is the lowest of all. And we have all learned that uh, projecting from mouse data to human data in cancer is, uh, uh, is delusional. Right, yeah. There was one specific question, and that's the last question, um, on the mechanism of the switching of the, the FOTAC. Specifically, why is this, this is a cis-on ligand? And, and, and how do you realize that? How do you I, wish, I wish I could answer this question. Uh, I hope this is not one of my reviewers, uh, because <laughs> I, okay. I got this very question. It's, a, it's an extremely interesting question. It's a huge, a very important question. If the compound had been transactive, active in the dark, it would have been much less useful, unless you uh, make them bistable. But uh, uh, as Gary Carrera and Craig Cruz did recently, by the way, but uh, we do not understand at this stage how they work exactly. And in all truth, nobody in the product world understands how exactly these molecules work and where the slightest change in a molecule making the short the linker just a little bit shorter completely destroys activity but it's exactly what we do we change the linker length and orientation with our photo switch and therefore chances were high that this was work but uh, stay tuned uh, we only have one paper out at this stage i'm sure that i'll be in, i'll be in this business for 10 years at least perfect Thank you very much, Dirk, for giving the insight on, uh, on the photopharmacology. Uh, it was really great. Um, just to everybody who joined late into the meeting, just the, the, the information that everything is recorded, what we do here, and the link will appear very soon on the Daily Academy web pages. So if you missed the first talk, you can still um, um, listen to it again uh, by using the link, which will come up soon. So we now move from chemistry to uh, biology, plant biology, uh, to our uh, second speaker. And I welcome Christian Frankhauser from the University of Lausanne. He is a professor at the Faculty of Biology and Medicine there at the University of Lausanne. And his research interests focus very much on effects on, of light on plant growth and development. So while the first talk was addressing light, um, on molecules and then effects in humans, we now go into the plant world. And Christian, all yours, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the invitation. I'd like to share with you my fascination for how uh, light shapes the body and the different organs uh, of plants in the next uh, 25 minutes or so. Um, and I start by using this uh, illustration that was actually used by the Daylight Academy to make a little bit of an analogy between uh, solar panels uh, and plants. Um, you probably all know that plants have this fascinating ability to basically transform solar energy into chemical energy through a process known as photosynthesis. And the major site of photosynthesis happens uh, in leaves of plants. And of course, it's kind of easy to see the analogy between these big, nice flat leaves here, green, and these solar panels shown on the right here uh, of this uh, little slide. And the reason why these leaves uh, appear green to our eyes is because the pigments which absorb, which harvest this uh, light energy are called uh, chlorophylls. And these chlorophylls mostly absorb in the blue and in the red part uh, of, of the solar spectrum. Now, plants actually have this ability uh, to transform solar energy into chemical energy, but they also use light uh, as a source of information. 
And collectively, this uh, phenomena is known as photomorphogenesis. In other words, how does light shape the body of a plant? And this is illustrated in this little movie here, where this uh, dark brown seedling was suddenly illuminated with uh, blue light coming from the side. And you can see that this reorients the growth of this little seedling, a phenomena known as phototropism. And if I want to take my analogy again a little bit with a solar panel, you know that some solar panels actually are equipped with a light sensor, which allows them to follow the uh, sun going through the sky and reorients this solar panel. And that's pretty much exactly what all of these plant uh, photoreceptors do. They basically allow the optimization of photosynthesis. That's one of their key uh, functions. Uh, they also do a number of other things, which I will briefly touch upon. Um, one of the best known uh, variables in the light environment that plants care about, it's not only plants, but animals do as well, is the change in day length. Uh, except if you live on the equator, this length of the day changes throughout of the year. And this provides precious information for many plants and animals, in particular, to allow them to reproduce at the most favorable time of the year. Uh, I think we all know that reproduction is actually a rather costly thing. And so you have to make sure that this happens at the time of the year when the resources uh, are available. Uh, there are other more sophisticated aspects behind this in some plants where reproduction requires the presence of insects so that they can bring the pollen from one plant to another. You also want to make sure that you make your flowers when the insects are here. So it's a very important timing uh, mechanism. Other changes in the light environment plants have to face uh, on a daily basis is whether you basically have a sunny sky or a, su a sky with clouds. And this has a very large impact on the intensity of light. Uh, and many of the adjustments that have to happen in the plant when this uh, level of light changes, and these changes are quite dramatic and can happen very quickly, actually happen at the level of uh, photosynthesis uh, itself. Um, however, various photoreceptors also contribute uh, to the adaptation to these changes in the light intensity, which can be, as I said, very, very quick. A third uh, change in this light environment, and that's the one I'm going to discuss uh, for the rest of this presentation mostly, is actually the information about the light environment gives very precious cues about where the plant is within its community. If the plant is in an open environment, not shaded by other competitors, it will basically get the sun spectrum shown in red on this slide here, which is basically what we get from the sun once it's filtered through the atmosphere down here on Earth. Uh, in contrast, if a plant is under a canopy of other plants, this spectrum is changed dramatically, which it's mostly depleted in the blue and the red because the chlorophyll pigments that I briefly mentioned before absorb these wavelengths. And so there is much more green and yellow, which is left. And interestingly, and I'll get back to this a little bit later, there is a lot of this far red light. We call this far red. This is red light that our eyes cannot really see anymore, but it's not quite infrared yet. But plants, as you will see, are very sensitive uh, to this far red light. And so this is a very, very different situation from a cloud because a cloud is, might just disappear a few minutes later. But actually, if you have a competitor growing above you, this is something which is probably going to stay. So plants actually react to this very differently. And the way they know it's not a cloud and it's a plant competitor is because this really changes the spectrum of uh, the light environment. So how do plants actually figure that out? Uh, it turns out that plants are full of photoreceptors. And this is a list of photoreceptor families present in all land plants, essentially. There is one family of UV photoreceptors. There are three distinct families of blue light photoreceptors. This response I showed you in one of the early slides, the phototropism is controlled by the so-called phototropins, which is one of these families of blue light photoreceptors. And the photoreceptors I'm going to discuss a little bit more are known as phytochromes, and they sense mostly red uh, and far red light. Now, you already heard a lot from the first talk about how our visual system works. And when I mentioned the word photoreceptor, 
there is sometimes some confusion as to what people mean. Uh, often animal biologists or your common person in the street thinks that the photoreceptor is actually this wonderful organ, the human eye or the eye of any animal for that matter. When I say photoreceptor, I mean the actual molecule, uh, the protein associated with a pigment uh, in most cases, which allows, which is regulated by the light environment. Uh, so these photoreceptors are analogous to the rhodopsin that were also uh, briefly discussed by Dirk uh, Traumer before. Uh, so plants uh, don't have a visual organ, uh, but they're full of photoreceptors. And it turns out that you find them a little bit everywhere in the plant, in leaves, in stems, in flowers, and surprisingly, you even find them, at least some of them, uh, in the roots. Um, and if you want to know why, we can discuss this later. And what do these photoreceptors do? Uh, this is a little summary. They basically control major developmental transitions throughout the life cycle of a plant. For example, when the plant uh, has a progeny, it's going to be in a seed, and the seed has a little embryo in it, which can be extremely resistant. At least the seeds can stay alive for hundreds of years in some places. But once they germinate to become a little seedling, they're actually very fragile. So the timing of this germination is something very important and the seed takes into consideration a number of criteria, including uh, the light environment. Um, this transition, which I briefly mentioned before from vegetative growth when the plant only makes leaf to reproduction is another key transition in the life cycle of the plant uh, <clears throat> because now this plant is gonna use a lot of resources to basically reproduce, has to happen at the right time. This is typically what is controlled by daylight. But also senescence, uh, the end of the life cycle of a plant is also controlled by the light environment, by multiple photoreceptors. And this is basically uh, a property given to plants because they can measure light intensity, but also color, and they can measure uh, day length. The responses I'm gonna discuss a bit more are what I would call adaptive responses, and mostly this shade avoidance response, which is shown on the right of the slide, where basically depending on whether the plant is in an open environment without shade from other plants or whether it is in a shaded environment, it will really change uh, its uh, morphology. And this is because plants can measure the spectral composition. Uh, in other words, this is some kind of a primitive way of color uh, discrimination. And they can also measure actually the direction of incoming light as exemplified with the little movie of the phototropism in the little seedling. <clears throat> so uh, how do plants respond to this shade cue from other plants? There are basically two major strategies and that depends on the plant species. There are so-called shade tolerant plants and they're mostly plants found in the tropics. They can live in the jungle understory. They can live of extremely low levels of light and there are a number of adaptations such as very big and flat uh, thin leaves. But most species and in particular most species which are agronomically relevant to us are actually species which are shade intolerant or shade avoiders. Sorry, I need to drink a little bit of water. And uh, these uh, shade intolerant species illustrated by this little blue guy here, when it's surrounded by these other plants, will try to top over uh, their neighbors. Uh, so essentially what we study in my lab is the fight for light uh, as uh, illustrated in this little cartoon where all these little grasses here try to grow taller than their neighbor. And this is actually quite a fierce battle out there in nature, uh, which I illustrate with uh, a few pictures here. One I like to show is the strangling fig tree. This is a vine, it germinates on the trunk of a tree, and then it climbs up that tree, and then eventually it shades the support tree so much that sometimes the support tree actually dies. And this is an example that I've seen myself in Queensland, Australia. You don't see a support tree anymore. This is now only the strangling fig tree. And its name is a bit of a misnomer because it didn't strangle the support tree, but it basically shaded it so much that eventually it ran out of resources and it died. Another example is the development of this fir tree here. Uh, and you like to have a beautiful fir tree for Christmas. And these fir trees are normally quite symmetrical. But here, if you look at it, this is the main stem. Uh, and all the branches are nicely developed on one side and there is almost no development on the other side. And that's because during the summer, this tree here 
uh, is green and totally shades this part of the tree. So this part is totally underdeveloped. And this sort of battle for light happens both in agricultural environment because our land is very precious, so we try to plant relatively densely, uh, but also in natural uh, meadows. Often light is the limiting factor, actually. So what happens, uh, basically what happens is that you have selective growth of specific parts of the plants, typically the stem elongates. This is illustrated in a tomato here, the shaded tomato on the right, the sun grown tomato on the left. Uh, this actually is advantage in the wild to wild species, but for agriculture this is a bit problematic and that's illustrated here with these radishes, where if you grow them at too high density, a lot of resources went into growing these parts here which are called petioles, uh, but then there is almost nothing left in the storage organ, which is actually what you like to buy in the market, so the farmer will have a hard time to sell it. So it does affect agriculture and it would be interesting to tune this a little bit. Uh, so the major strategies to basically uh, get access to more light for the plants are either phototropism, which basically tells the plant in which direction do I have to grow to get the best possible light, controlled by these blue light photoreceptors, the phototropins, and there are uh, this so-called shade avoidance response, which is predominantly a response to the ratio of red to far red light, which is controlled by the phytochrome uh, photoreceptors. So I have my red and blue research team, depending on what their favorite photoreceptor is, and some of them also integrate a little bit. So let me just tell you a little story about phytochrome very briefly. So uh, these are the spectra of phytochrome in its inactive form PR, it's synthesized as PR. And this is actually uh, the light, the photochemistry behind this is also an isomerization of a double bond. Uh, and it's a linear tetraperol in this case, it's the chromophore. Uh, and upon light activation, you will have a PFR conformation, which is actually very long-lived. Um, and then you can switch it back with this long wavelength far red light. So related photo switches are now quite desirable in optogenetics to try to get deep tissue penetration and things like this. So you can think of all kinds of application. But for this talk, what you need to remember is that PFR, the far red light absorbing one, is the one which is active. And then uh, you can either go back into the inactive state by thermal relaxation, which is normally pretty slow, or by actually applying this far red light. Now, if we think about this uh, response to shade, what happens is that in sunlight, this ratio of red to far red light is relatively high. It's slightly above one. So you have a substantial amount of your phytochrome, which, in it, which is in its active PFR conformation. And what this essentially does is that it inhibits elongation of the stem. In contrast, when you are in the shade, you have much more depletion of the red than of the far red, so this ratio drops dramatically, so you lose your active phytochrome, and so now you only have the inactive phytochrome, and it seems that you have some kind of a default state where now the plant grows. Now I have a little movie which summarizes some of the molecular findings that we made that I'm going to show you in the comment. Um, so we're going to look a little bit inside of a plant. So let's first look at a plant which is grown in the sun, and let's go first zoom in to the leaf uh, of this plant. And then when we zoom into the leaf of this plant, what we're going to see is what happens in the nucleus of one of these plants, and your phytochrome is in the active conformation. When it's active, it interacts with so-called transcriptional regulators, which are called PIFs, and this interaction actually leads to the destruction of these transcriptional regulators. As a consequence of this, these transcriptional regulators do not induce the expression of their favorite target genes. And one of the consequences of this destruction or inactivation of these PIF transcription factors is that a major growth regulator, which is called auxin in plants, is present at pretty low levels. There is always going to be some auxin because it's an essential growth hormone, but the levels are going to be relatively low. And when the levels are relatively low, growth is relatively modest. In contrast, if you now look at what happens in the shade, your phytochrome is now mostly in its inactive form. And now the PIFs can accumulate and they bind to the regulatory regions of target genes. And I show two target genes here. One of them codes for an enzyme, which is catalyzing the rate limiting step in the biosynthesis of this growth hormone, which is called auxin. So now you produce this hormone, uh, this uh, enzyme, and you then produce the hormone. And another interesting target gene is actually um, coding for a transporter for this auxin. So you now start to produce much more auxin in the leaf, 
And through the action of these transporters, which are called pin proteins, this hormone, which is mostly produced in the leaves, is then transported down the stem. <clears throat> and if we now look at what happens within the stem of these little plants, is you now suddenly have much more oxen, which flows down. Uh, you also have more of these transporters. And this is transported from cell to cell. And what happens if the, the concentration of oxen gets higher in these stem cells, essentially these cells start to elongate. And as a result of this, you will see macroscopically that uh, your little plant uh, gets longer. And that's a summary of some of the things we have done, but many other people contributed uh, in the field, just to get you an idea of how the mechanism goes. But it's actually very quick. You go straight from the photoreceptor to transcriptional uh, regulation. Now, just in the last few seconds, I want to tell you something about what happens actually when only part of the plant is being shaded. And so I go back to my image of the fir tree here, where only this part of the tree was shaded. So we are not brave enough to study this in fir trees because you need a lot of space and a lot of time. So all of our research is done in a very simple little plant, which is called Arabidopsis, which is a weed that you may encounter in your garden. And so we wanted to find out whether we can also see these local uh, shade responses. So what we did <clears throat> is illustrated here on the left. And just with a little LED, we changed the red to far red ratio very specifically just on one leaf here. You can see this little part of the leaf, which is uh, yellow here. This is where we selectively change the red to far red ratio. And if you do this, then we measure the position of the leaf, which is shown on this graph here. And as you can see, the leaf where we irradiated just the tip, you can see the leaf basically went up. So you can imagine my arm is a leaf, you know, this leaf went up. But the other leaves of that plant, they don't move at all. They don't care. So it's really only the leaf which received this cue uh, and actually specifically received the cue on this part of the leaf, which is called the leaf blade, which moved. If you give the same cue to the stem here, actually nothing happens. Um, and we believe that this is probably a good strategy because there is a lot of self-shading happening at the level of the stem, but at this level, not so much. Now, these leaves are actually even smarter than that because you can uh, allow, you can twist them into changing their position, not only going up, but actually also moving sideways, depending on where you change, uh, where you provide the signal. So if you provide the signal at the tip of the leaf, this is what I showed you before, this leaf specifically moves up, but if you now want to look whether it moves laterally, which is shown on the right hand side of the slide, you see that it doesn't move. But if you change this cue selectively now <clears throat> sidewise, the leaf still moves up, which is a good strategy for these plants to try to overtop neighbors, but it now also moves laterally. So it's almost a bit like a bit of a radar that you have all around the rim of this leaf, and depending on where it gets the cues, it totally reorients uh, its organ. So my little summary is that plants are full of photoreceptors and one important role of these photoreceptors is to optimize photosynthesis by modulating organ growth and the position uh, of these organs. So that's pretty much it. Yeah, perfect. I'll answer questions if anybody has it. <laughs> Christian, thank you. That was fascinating to see what plants do with their photoreceptors on there. I think you can end sharing this slide so that ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me do the discussion that. people with, uh, with the larger images on there. Uh, uh, where do we do that? Uh, and no, I, did, did I stop that? No, stop share, stop share. Here we go. Okay, perfect. Very good. All right. Um, I would like to start with the, with the question you, you already kind of mentioned. There are photoreceptors at the root of a plant, yeah. but it's dark at the root of the plant. What does the photoreceptor, uh, for what is good there? Well, there are different uh, ideas behind this. Um, there is a long discussed idea that there is light piping actually. Uh, so basically uh, the plant tissue will almost be like an optic fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit controversial. It's difficult to measure exactly how much light would go down there. But I mean, as we've seen with the human eye, which is incredibly sensitive, it's actually very much true for plants as well. So it's not impossible. But I think what is more likely is soil disturbances and things like this. You know, a root likes to be in the dark, but uh, there are quite often disturbances of the soil. Uh, and then the root wants to hide again. And so it uses both gravity as a cue, but also light as a cue. So I showed you in the shoot it actually grows towards the light. But if you do the same experiment and look at what the root will do, the root will grow away from the light. And one of the photoreceptors which is present in these root uh, tips is actually the phototropin. 
Okay, right. Yeah. Um, then there was a then there was a question here from the from the audience. Can we learn from the principles you have shown us? And and they were in, in, intriguing how the how the 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 leaf is moving. Can we learn from these principles? How to control, for example, the efficiency of a, of let's say a solar panels, so of technical apparatus that also um, I think they go for the same goal. They would like to have the maximum exposure on there. I, I guess the difficulty is, you know, how much more complication do you have to put to a solar panel uh, so that it tracks the sun, and basically, uh, is it beneficial in the end? to add all these levels of complexity mm. so that you can make something where you really have a gain. Of course, you can probably harvest more light, uh, but whether it's worth it, uh, you know, many more pieces could break apart. These things have to work for many years so that it actually uh, is economically viable. And I'm not in a very good position to uh, answer the question. In theory, certainly, and that's probably why many plants will do this, uh, but whether you can you practically uh, turn this into your solar panels which follow the sun and something like this which makes economical sense i i don't know yeah but what i learned from your talk is that measuring the spectral distribution so in other words the color of the light on there mm -hmm. is, is a very important information uh um, and and it decodes information so it could be in principle used to get certain information for shading for whatever directions day or month on there. Mm -hmm. There was another question because somebody worried about the, the, what happens with the with these fig tree after it has overgrown and shadowed the the, um, the host tree. So th did it collapse? No, they actually live for quite long. I mean, the, this cathedral fig tree, which I, uh, which I showed in this picture is in one of the national parks in uh, Queensland. Mm -hmm. People think it's about 500 years old, but uh, it's a bit of an estimate. So I don't know for how long it has lived uh, without the support tree, but they can actually uh, survive for quite long. Uh, like that. Okay, right. So they support themselves now. Yeah? Um, some plants, and, and we notice they don't like so much sun and so much light. So are the mechanism you described for when they hunt for light, the plants, are they then reversed? And you also briefly mentioned mechanisms that a plant can do to, uh, to protect uh, themselves for too much light on there. Maybe you can briefly refer to this. Yeah, so one of the key mechanisms to protect from excess light, which is a big problem, huh? because actually sunlight, if, if sunny day, around 40% of it, you already max out the capacity of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So all the rest of that light, Basically, the plant has to dissipate, and a lot of it is being dissipated through heat, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, is an issue. Um, and some of these events are actually embedded, I would say, in uh, the, the greater uh, definition of how photosynthesis works mm -hmm. uh, with all kinds of sophisticated mechanisms. Uh, another feature is that plants need the light. <clears throat> and so it's like us when we want to go sunbathe. We need to put some sunscreen because we like to go into the light. Um, and so the plants need to uh, basically make their own sunscreen. And so this UV photoreceptor is key there mm -hmm. because it controls the synthesis of um, pigments which absorb in the UV. Mm -hmm. So that basically plants are now capable of not you know, having the sunlight that they absolutely need, but not suffering the consequences of uh, the UV wavelengths. Finally, regarding a shade-loving plant versus a sun-loving plant, uh, actually at the molecular level, we know very little about it. We know that the photoreceptors themselves are shared. They exist in pretty much old land plants, even the most simple land plants, which you know, evolved on the surface of this planet around 450 million years ago. They have the same suite of photoreceptors. Uh, but probably the wiring, and that's often how it works in biology. The components are the same, but the way you wire the different components is different. And so I think what will happen, for example, is that you control to have you know, nice expansion of your leaf uh, and so that you know, the, your solar panel becomes very large, uh, but it's very thin. In, in, a, in a plant which is in the sun, you actually have multiple layers of cells in which photosynthesis happens. So you have a gradient of shading within the leaf itself. 
So maybe the top layers are not going to be optimal because they have too much, but the lower layer, layers are going to be fine. But in a plant which is typically living under a canopy, you will not have multiple layers because you know the top layer already has a hard time to basically uh, get enough light. There is also a very fascinating plant uh, for which they have described uh, <clears throat> that it basically makes a pigment which looks, I don't know if you see these blue butterflies, which are almost a little bit, uh, when they close their wings, they look very black and when they open them, it's this beautiful blue. And so this tropical plant has this as well. And this somehow shifts the spectrum of the light a little bit over and uh, optimizes the photosynthesis. So that's one fascinating mechanism. But in general, we don't know very much about those. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, agricultural plants, it's really the one I know is, is coffee, which is not a sun loving one. Mm -hmm. uh, which is typically planted together with other plants. Most agricultural plants actually like to avoid it. And so, fascinating topic, but we have to move on. Christian, thank you very much for sharing this and, and give us an insight. It's really fascinating what nature has uh, in mechanisms on there. We now change topic again and uh, we move to Andreas Schüller, our third um, um, speaker. He is a uh, um, a research associate at the EPFL and he works in at the at the, the topic of light and energy and nanostructured materials are in focus materials for solar energy conversion and um, yeah nanotechnology and he will uh, talk about smart materials for daylight management so we are now going more to the technological side uh, to uh, manage and use daylight uh, in buildings and for energy conversion. Andreas, all yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Burkhardt. Let me uh, split the screen, share the screen. So it should be this one. Do you have it on your screen now? Perfect, very good. Good, okay. So we, uh, we have heard uh, in how important daylight is for the plants and the daylight is also important for the human beings. We developed while spending most of our time outdoors. Today we spend most of our time indoors and it's uh, daylight has a great impact on our well-being, on our health. So uh, we have to care about how we manage the daylighting in our buildings. And I believe that uh, with smart materials, with innovative materials, we can contribute a big deal to this topic. Let me start with uh, an example from China. This is a building with a, a large part of the facade, which is glazed. Uh, it's a library in Shenzhen. So this is the outside view of the building. And this is the inside view of the building. Uh, so the people uh, might be happy to work with a lot of daylight, however, they have to protect themselves for thermal comfort and they also for visual comfort. So uh, how could we manage the daylight? Sun protection is a big issue today in buildings and it's still an issue where we still have to make progress. If you put the blinds at the exterior, then after some time you can have mechanical problems. If you put the blinds in the interior of the building, then it's difficult to rid get rid of the excess heat. One good solution could be electrochromic windows. Uh, with electrochromic windows, you can control the transmittance on demand. So you can switch it either to a clear or to a dark state, and you can keep uh, the solar energy out in, wind, uh, in, in summer, saving on cooling energy. You can also have more solar energy in winter, saving heating energy. You can have also more daylighting in winter uh, and daylighting is good for our well-being. Now, uh, the problem with, uh, or one of the problems with the previous technologies was that there was a liquid electrolyte which is, uh, uh, was necessary. And uh, this is, a, I took this photograph from our building. We installed some years ago uh, a uh, glazing based on this technology and uh, we could see after some time the outgassing of the liquid, uh, liquid electrolyte component and there were these damages to the edges. So durability is very important in buildings. So it would be good to shift to a technology which is all solid state based, uh, no longer liquids involved because it's very, very difficult to keep uh, an object uh, tight for uh, tenth uh, of years. So how would this work? We would start with a glass substrate 
um, that would be shown here, we, we would uh, deposit a first transparent electrode here, a transparent conductor of oxide. Then we would put a nanocomposite cathodic layer here. We would put the solid ion conductor and then a, an anodic electrochromic layer again. And we need a top electrode, which again is transparent. This looks very much like a thin film micro battery. So when we charge this battery, the lithium ions would migrate from the anode to the cathode and both uh, electrochromic layers would tint. Now, uh, a device which has been made by our PhD student Olivia in our laboratory looks like this. So there is the one, the cathodic electrochromic layer based on tungsten trioxide, then is tantalum oxide as a solid ion conductor and the counter electrode is based on nickel tantalum oxide. And there is the top layer of indium tin oxide. Now, how do we get the ions across this uh, solid ion conductor? Some of the ions have to find their way through this solid conductor. This solid conductor here, lithium uh, phosphorus oxynitride, is a good example. It's popular from battery research. So uh, the, you can see the, um, the gray little balls are the lithium ions. And uh, one migration path for the lithium ions is the vacancy migration path. So a lithium ion would uh, migrate and just fill up a, a, a site here, a vacancy site, and uh, there would be then an energy barrier involved. This energy barrier would then be seen here as a bump in this energy diagram. A different uh, migration part, this, an alternative migration part, is the interstitial migration part, uh, where the lithium ions migrate here in between the lattice sites. And there are also energy barriers involved here. And in this case, the energy barriers are a little bit higher and the dominating uh, migration part is most probably the vacancy migration part. So we have to prepare these coatings. We have to make these materials. This is a snapshot of our laboratory. So um, uh, we would start by introducing a glass slide into our chamber, this indu an introduction chamber. Then we would make coatings onto the glass slide here in this deposition chamber in the center. Uh, of this installation. And then we have the possibilities for surface analysis. We have electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis here on the right. And we have scanning tunneling microscopy here on the left hand side. So the, a good, uh, a great advantage of the system is that we can make a sample and analyze the surface of the sample without taking it out to, to air. So we have a very good image of the as prepared surfaces. Here a close up of the film deposition. It's a plasma deposition. So we do have in the center of the chamber magnetrons. These, those are the magnetic electrodes. We would ignite a glow discharge here. This is a cold plasma. And then we would have film growth here on the opposite side here, uh, where we would put the substrate. In industry, uh, there are similar processes already established today. So in industry, these machines look very uh, impressive. They are they're very long. So we would have like 200 meters of vacuum uh, the cathode would be now 3 meters 60 long and uh, the dimensions of the glass panes to be treated would be 3 by 7 meters. So we need to get the lithium into the system. So uh, Olivia developed a lithiation process for that purpose. So uh, we have now a process in order to lithiate our uh, coatings uh, in the vacuum system. So we would start by depositing a tungsten trioxide layer and then uh, inserting the lithium here by a special resublimation process. So this is uh, important to, to uh, fill up the device with the lithium and then we would continue and build up the, the other layers so that the lithium is contained in the multi-layered system. And then we can make switching systems here. So we, this is a spectrum of uh, transmission for the dark state, that is the solid line here, the, the black line, and for the clear state, that is the green light, uh, line here. And uh, you can calculate the visible transmittance. This uh, device switches from 63 to 3% in visible transmittance. And the energetic transmittance switches from 59% uh, to about 2%. The switching speed is also important. Oh, this uh, is really the order of uh, 10 seconds. So here we measure the transmittance at one uh, wavelength, 650 nanometers, and we would measure the transition time. And this is really in this time scale. And uh, this is very important also for the application in buildings. The, the window should switch 
uh, on the second time scale ideal. Uh, so there is also a roadmap where we should go with materials for uh, electrochromics. So of course we want to uh, increase durability. We want to also increase the coloration efficiency and uh, we want to reduce the switching time. And uh, uh, currently commercial electrochromics is uh, based on uh, solid materials. Uh, this would be in this region here. Then uh, uh, currently we work on nanostructuring these materials, making nanocomposite films. So we will be here in this field. And in the future, uh, we might shift also uh, to plasmonic electrochromics, where we could also have select a switch in the near infrared sp uh, spectrum of the solar radiation. And in the far future, uh, maybe we would have best control with plasmonic electrochromic nanocrystals. So this technology today is still an expensive the technology. It's mainly used in prestigious buildings. Now, it, it would also be good to find a low-cost alternative to this. And there we have an approach which comes from our research group. Um, so we were inspired by our institute building. Our institute has a glazed facade with a large window for the vision section and a smaller window here in the upper region of the facade for the daylighting section. So we thought about what would we would like to have in the ideal case. So in the winter, we would like to have uh, high solar transmittance. We would like to ideally take some of the sunlight and redirect it to the, uh, to the depth of the office room. So not only person A would then have enough uh, light for working, but also person B would have uh, good daylighting conditions. So we would also like to have large uh, solar heat gains in order to save on heating energy and a weak reflection from the building. And uh, this, this would be a good winter situation. Now in summer, the sun is higher in the sky. And in this case, we still want to have light in the depth of the office room for person B. Now we want to reduce the solar gains in order to have uh, savings on the cooling energy. So we would, would reflect some of the energy outside of the building. And we would uh, uh, like to provide glare pr protection for person A. Now, uh, we, we thought about possible geometries, how to do it, and we came up with the idea to uh, integrate very small micro mirrors into the glass pane. So we would have a set of parabolic mirrors here, and uh, we would have a second set of planar mirrors behind. So in winter, the, the light would be redirected to the back of the office room, that would work nicely, and in summer, the, the set of the primary mirrors would uh, reflect the, uh, and focus the light on the secondary mirrors and then pick out the excess sunlight. So uh, we came up with this geometry after a couple of uh, simulations. Uh, our PhD student André Costro uh, programmed a simulation tool and we run a large campaign of simulation in order to find this geometry. In between, we have uh, novel geometries with our PhD student Jin Gong. So uh, here we propose to add uh, the mirror, make it a little bit longer, longer the structure, make it the mirror from one structure basically, and have this 90 degree angle here in the corner. And then we would even send this uh, sunlight back to the sky in the awaiting situation. So we would have less of the heat in the street canyon, and we would also have less glare in the street canyon in our cities. So uh, we would like to estimate the potential of this new idea. So we uh, run simulations and uh, we were looking here uh, at the horizontal illuminance uh, in, as a function of the distance from the glazing. And it turned out that uh, uh, in, in certain situations, in at the spring equinox uh, at noon time, uh, we have a large increase in horizontal illuminance also in the back of the room. So we really can efficiently uh, efficiently send back the light to the to the back of the room and this is great advantage now we have to average this uh, uh, over one year in order to find uh, the full benefits and even if we average over one year even with diffuse sky which is sometimes there we still have some increase uh, of the horizontal illumination in the back of the room and uh, this is a logarithmic scale so this little difference here is still uh, quite considerable uh, in the back of the room. Uh, we also care about visual comfort. So we need high uh, visual comfort for both ergorama and panorama. So ergorama, we would call the 60 degree cone here ergorama and the 120 uh, 
a degree uh, going here panorama and we would like to avoid excessive contrast di uh, differences, especially in the algorithm. So our simulation says that for standard glazing, we have uh, uh, many situations where this high contrast situation occurs, while for the microstructured glazing, we have a much more homogeneous illumination of the work plane. So it's also a good advantage. Furthermore, we also believe that we can have uh, strong advantages in glare protection for the direct glare. So we have to make this uh, and we have to work out a procedure of making this. We would start with the origination of a master mold. We do this by laser ablation. We create this uh, microstructured master. We would then replicate the master. This is done uh, with uh, UV curable uh, resins. Then we have the replicated uh, micro microstructure. We would deposit mirror coatings on one side of the structures and finally encapsulate the mirrors. And then we would have the fully emerged mirrors in our glass pane. So uh, we start for origination, we make a mask for laser ablation, we do the laser ablation in collaboration with uh, Empa and Toon, uh, and then uh, we obtain this master mold, we will replicate it, and uh, um, here is a snapshot of the master mold. So we, we took a, a polycarbonate sheet and we did this structuring by laser ablation. And already the master mold sh shows this property of light redirection, which is shown here in the image. Uh, we also need good transparency. So uh, the, here we have a, a little laboratory sample, uh, which uh, shows clearly that uh, also with the integrated micromers, you can read uh, when you look through the samples. And uh, the, the, the vision for uh, the need for transparency is clearly there in, in the building if you think of uh, windows. Currently, we are working on making this bigger. So we have the first prototype uh, glazing just with André Costo and in collaboration with PIS Switzerland. We, have, we, we made two, years, uh, two weeks ago the first uh, glazing in real size and we want to put it here in a test building. This is the Nest platform at uh, uh, Ampar campus, the Solace module, and we would like to install the new glazing here in order to test whether it brings some benefits for the users of the building. So let me sum up for electrochromic glazing. This uh, uh, provides transmission control on demand. Uh, there is uh, an improved durability uh, if we use solid iron conductors. It's very important that uh, building materials are stable during the next 25 years or even longer, better 50 years, huh? stability. Then uh, with novel nanocomposite films, we can obtain a higher switching speed and also a stronger switching contrast, um, which is also very important. Um, for the microstructured glazing, we have uh, um, the additional advantage that we can redirect the light so we can have more daylight in the back of the room. We can combine this with the glare protection. We have an improved visual comfort in the agorama. And we can also obtain seasonal dependent solar heat gains. So saving cooling energy in summer and saving heating energy in winter. Uh, this works best for direct radiation. Um, and uh, in a mixed situation, as we have it in Lausanne, it already makes sense. And this is a very cost-effective solution because we don't have to have electricity here. We don't have to have this transparent conductive electrodes. The system is much simpler. And therefore, uh, we, we are, now today we think of making it in, uh, in a road roll process uh, with uh, BASF Switzerland, our industrial partner. In, 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 uh, as a cost-effective alternative. So I would still like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, our PhD student, Olivia Bouvard for Electrochromics and André Costro and Jing Gong for uh, uh, the microstructured glazing. Uh, many important help from uh, some people in, in the group. We also have the collaborations on campus EPFL, which is very important for us. We have collaboration with Ampatoon, uh, the group of uh, Patrick Hoffman, uh, we are very grateful for our financial support uh, for, uh, from uh, the funding agencies. And of course, we are very happy also for this exchange with the industrial partners. 
uh, very important here is BASF Switzerland for the microstructure glazing and Sage Glass for electrochromes. And I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Thank you, thank you, Andreas, for sharing these very two interesting stories with us on technological developments. And uh, I'm sure there are a few questions, but let me start off with a very simple practical one. The electrochromic windows are, of course, fascinating and they are used in a way, but they are, and, and I think your approach to make them as a, a, a solid state module is very good. What would be the estimated price of something like this? So uh, the price uh, today for electrochromic windows is uh, still too expensive. So uh, um, let me check whether I find some price information here. I even have a, um, a slide on this. Um, maybe I jump. So uh, electrochromic is, so there have been simulations for uh, the town of Atlanta in the States. And they found out that electrochromic glazing would be competitive when the cost is below $20 per square foot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that means that when electrochromic glazing is lower, uh, it becomes cheaper than that, then you can save money by installing electrochromic glazing. Mm -hmm. Now it's still too expensive. It's, uh, it's about a factor of three too expensive today. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then is the, there is the question, can we get there? Maybe we can even get there. If you compare to the learning curve in photovoltaics, there is uh, an observation that with increase in production volume, the price get down. And if you look at the prices for silicon photovoltaics, the price dropped uh, 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 enormously in the past. So already in the last uh, 15 years, the price dropped more than a uh, factor of four in, in photovoltaics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the factor of three in price drop for electrochromics might be feasible. It, it, it could be possible. Um, however, today it's still uh, um, a technology for prestigious buildings. There is an additional value, of course, because you, in some cases you, have, you gain also visual comfort, you gain uh, controllability of the visual ambience. You don't have to have mechanical moving parts. So at EPFL, we have some buildings where we have to replace the mechanical blinds from, from year to year. So there are other advantages with electrochromics. But I believe if you really can make it on the large scale, there might be the possibility that we can reach uh, the competitiveness on the economical. Uh, okay, aspect. yeah, thank you for the, for the, the estimate. That is going. There was one question: Is the is it possible because some of the in, in the second project you reflect in summer part of the light? So, but the light is in principle energy because daylight is a kind of diluted energy. So, could you combine this with kind of uh, uh, harvesting energy? So, with uh, photovoltaics? Yes, this would be a very very good idea. So, uh, we would if, if we go back to this mirror-like geometry. So the light is reflected by the secondary plane mirror. So it's focused by the first parabolic mirror and then focused on the secondary plane mirror. We could think of putting a photovoltaic element here. It could be either a photovoltaic cell, which we put, would place in this spot. And in the situation of uh, when we have too much light, we would just produce electricity from this light from the window, or we could, put something here which somehow harvests and harvests and concentrate late, light. There are also concepts around in order to concentrate light, for instance, luminescent concentrators. So we could think of combined systems. Today we are far from being there, so ideas are around. Uh, we have to make it also in the laboratory. Um, however, I think there, in the future there are many interesting uh, roads to go. Yeah. Maybe one last question from my side. When putting um, these mirrors into the window and you showed the one slide where you look through these glass, it, um, it looked not completely transparent. So do we lose some of the vision having these mirror structures in there? I would guess so. So you don't see the mirrors. The mirrors are too small for being visible. However, uh, what you can see is a small ghost image. The small ghost image is related to the diffraction of the light by, by the periodic structure. And now the recommendation is that we put mirrors in the top, in the daylighting section, I would put metallic mirrors. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. uh, and these metallic mirrors would be useful in order to redirect the light in the depth of the room. And in the vision section, I would put selective mirrors, mirrors which uh, would reflect only the near infrared. Mm -hmm. So we still maintain the seasonal dynamics and we would put invisible mirrors and we would also avoid the glare problem with these selective coatings. Mm -hmm. So there are diff different types of products then. So if you think of the building envelope in the lower part, we would have another uh, uh, product than in the upper part. Perfect. Right, so I currently don't see any further questions right now and we're also, I think, well in time. Andreas, could you stop sharing your screen yes. Right? Yes. so that we go back to the normal mode here? Perfect, very good. Um, good, so thank you to all of the three speakers on there. Um, I think we, we have seen a quite nice um, walk through the different, uh, to the topic and, and looked at it from different perspectives. At least what I take from this, uh, from this uh, hour and a half that the concepts in chemistry and even uh, medicine and then also going to biology are not so different. No? So light is used for control, light is used for adapt things. Um, and the technological solutions are there also take on some of these concepts. And uh, I think we can definitely learn from each other. And it's, it's interesting to see how, how close some of the concepts work and transferring biological kind of models into technical solutions. Uh, of course, it's, it's always a different solution, but uh, the concept stays in a way uh, the same. So I found this very interesting that there are quite a number of similarities and, and combined things on there. Right, so with this, we're coming to the end of the virtual symposium. Once again, thank you to the uh, speakers um, and uh, also thank you to everybody who joined us. I would like to remind that everything was recorded and you have the chance to um, listen to it again by going on to the link on the Daylight Academy website. Please stay in tune for any further activities of this kind of the Daylight Academy. And last but not least, I would like to thank um, uh, Marion and Lydia, so the two people in the Daylight Academy office who made this all possible and who were uh, behind the technique of this. So with this, I'm closing our symposium. Thank you for joining and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.